Damas y caballeros del pueblo 3151 con destino Santa Clara, Cuba. Cuba does have a very long and, and pretty intense tradition of especially music uh, around Latin America um, as well as art. And, and in terms of music, I mean, I cannot underestimate the power of Cuban salsa. Welcome everybody. So my name is Norkis and our driver's name is Onai. Of course now we go for lunch. And then we will walk a little bit around the historical center of Santa Clara. The place where we have lunch is one of the private restaurants that we call Paladares. A lot of rice and beans. Um, I love the chicken and beef here. The, the hamburger is a great invention. The Cuban sandwich is a better invention. <laughs> <laughs> Every single drink we've ordered has Havana Club on it, and that's because Havana Club is a, is a company owned by the government, and so everything has that on there. And mango juice, which is really, really good, and it was very fresh and unartificial, which I was very happy about. The decent restaurants have four or five people working full time out on the street finding what they need for tonight's dinner. The prices went up 15% in 2012, 15% in 2013, 28% last year. The poor, the poorest of the Cubans spend 70% of their income on food because everything else is free, remember, and they don't pay any taxes, and they don't, right? so they, almost all their money goes to food. So, those people are not happy. So what do you guys just buy here? We have a lot of pineapple. For how much? 10 pesos. 10 pesos. Is worth it. Totally worth it. Yeah. One interesting thing about Cuban coffee is that it really wasn't as strong as I was expecting it to be, but that's because, especially with coffee and chocolate, um, the more organic and untouched it is, the less bitter it will be. And so that really reflects on the organic culture of Cuban um, food. Then we have the entremeses, which are the starters and the appetizing course. So this is a ham starter with capers. I've noticed that capers is something that has popped up a lot with um, a lot of really nice bright acidity. And then here's the ceviche, which is supposed to be Castro's favorite. And um, they're usually served with vegetables. One thing that could happen with the lift of the embargo is maybe a fast food takeover. And star small restaurants are charming and they foster a lot of growth of those businesses. However, if a fast food company comes in, then it, the culture will, will dramatically change and people will start buying other, other things. However, I believe that the government won't let that really happen because they are. They would be cautionary against those overpowering food industries that might take over those other small businesses. Coming from America, you typically think of Cuba as this desolate place. However, when I came here, I actually saw that a lot of the architecture, food, just everything is a lot more modern than most people think it is. Immediately as we got into the country of Cuba, the architecture was very. Uh, there. It's different, it's more exciting, it's more colorful, the bright pinks and blues and greens and yellows, everywhere you go, the different styles, the squares and rectangles, and then also the like big colonial styles, uh, I thought was a very interesting contrast. The Spanish architecture here, it's quite like in a Hollywood movie. If you go to Miami or Texas, it's quite similar. You're walking in a movie, it's like you're in a movie set. I think it's beautiful, it's arches and like big and tall buildings but not 
so imposing like a skyscraper or just a big building. And now going more into the Soviet period, as you might have noticed the big concrete buildings here, which were really made not for aesthetic, not to be pretty, to be useful, to be functional. They're concrete buildings with small rooms, three squares, that's your room, that's your house. What I really think is the colorful buildings represents the colorful culture that uh, Cuba has. So much of the like art you see on the streets is like tourism centered and tourism produced for, but then you go into the museums and you see some art with more political meanings that aren't necessarily created, that weren't created to be sold and weren't created for a tourism market. Um, we're never really going to see the full story. All we can try to do is consider all the perspectives out there. start with this piece, El Rato de las Mulatas, um, by Carlos Enriquez of 1938. You might remember it from the museum. This is kind of like the beginning of um, Cuban political art because supposedly these soldiers are said to represent the fighters from the first independence war. But what's really interesting is to look at the faces of the women in the picture because the women really make this picture a Cuban political statement. And so it's said because these women are drawn so differently than other women at the time, their features aren't dainty, petite, love, uh, you know, lovingly crafted for the male gaze, no. These are definite, sharp female features. These, and, the, and this woman especially, she has a determined look in her eyes. It gives her some sense of agency, and it's also supposed to signify Cuban strength and Cuban nationalism. I'm gonna have one more painting to show by Carlos Enriquez, which is, um, I found really interesting the other day that Nelson talked about, which is Los Campesinos Felices, the happy farmers. Um, and this is a portrait of um, clearly unhappy farmers. And there's this really interesting element that I wish was in better quality here, which is a poster. Um, and it actually has a pig, a pig's face, and a top hat and a suit. And it's supposed to represent the imperialist, American, you know, outside European imperialist influence are trying to get the support of these native people who are struggling and they're trying to pretend like everything's normal and that these politicians are doing the right thing when in reality these politicians are pigs and they're taking all the resources and money in the country and these people are starving. It's more nuanced than the previous piece of just Cuban nationalism to more of this is what, this is, and for, for it to be in the museum today is it shows this is what it was like before the revolution, when no one was providing for us, when we were starving, and then those capitalist pigs on the poster were just simply mocking our struggles and you know being in Cuba for their own reasons and using Cuba to get rich. The kind of more modern art I'm going to talk about that has overt political messages. So um, I studied Cacho my junior year in Spanish class. I did an entire um, you know just complete study of all of his works. He uses a lot of boats, um, boat imagery and driftwood. He talks a lot about the permanence of memory and how memory is distorted once um, time separates you from it. It's a completely immersive, interactive um, exhibit. This is meant to um, simulate the experience of the Cuban five political prisoners who were held in the U.S. after they were discovered as spies. And so this exhibit basically simulates their experience in solitary confinement. The embargo, yes, is from the US, but we've heard a lot of those professionals talk about how they've, they've learned in the European tradition as well, and it's not like they're completely cut off from influences, um, and especially with the music, influences from the US are very common. I was kind of expecting Cuban music to be sort of like other stereotypically Latin American music I've heard, so syncopated, offbeat, upbeat, very dramatic, etc. heard a little bit about the music from the demonstrative lecture on day five and it was explained to us how Cuban music has a lot of influences such as from Europe, from the US, from Brazil, and from Africa because there used to be slavery in Cuba with Africans. At the demonstrative lecture they play several different songs including an African song um, because African songs in influence Cuban musical culture and this particular song was a prayer for the most important God and it was very slow, passionate, operatic and reverent.
We also heard a 19th century contradanza, which is influenced by the French tradition of contradance as well as some African traditions. And this was very melodic and rhythmic. <laughs> We also heard the 19th century boledo, which is influenced by Europe in that it is played on European instruments, or at least it was during the demonstrative lecture. And then this was um, medium tempo with a light melody. <laughs> This is a fragment of a song from a collection of songs from the second half of the 15th century, very old song. That could have been the sound brought by the sailors in their ships. It's not actually as similar to other Latin music as I thought. It's much jazzier and it's more swung and it's actually very unique to Cuba in a way that I didn't understand before. It really is a, a absolute staple of every single celebration you will have anywhere. Graduation parties, weddings, uh, late night hangouts, whatever, there's going to be salsa there. And within those salsa uh, singers, there's going to be a Cuban one, I can assure you.
practiced in Cuba four religions with African roots. The most popular, and everybody know about that, Santeria. Indeed, they have been mixed with each other, and at the same time, they were forced to be mixed with other spiritual tendencies, like Catholicism or spirit, Spiritism. That's why today, we practice all of them together. And in Cuba, you could be Catholic, Protestant, practice Afro-Cuban traditions, communist and homosexual at the same time without any conflict. The headquarters of Santeria was Havana and Matanzas, but now it's Ancien Fuego, and now it is widespread all over the island, all over the island. Being part of the community of Santeria is being protected by the spirit of nature. In Cuba, we worship or we call the energy of the spirits from Arab spirits, Indian spirits, but notice that they are not our native Indians, they are not Arab ones. They are Indians from the United States of America. One of the reasons is that during the 40s in Cuba and 50s, we had a lot of uh, very famous Western films from the United States of America. Here in Blue Tunnel, we have Yemaya, that is the sea, maternity fertility, the mistress of the surface of the sea, the mother of the world, and everything they bring in that Are there any other places where Santeria is specifically, or other religions like it, or other cultural heritage like it are practiced? Santeria is practiced nowadays all over the world. We have exported Santeria to the United States of America. Even I have seen people in China that they practice Santeria. But uh, not just Santeria, we have uh, Voodoo in Haiti, we have Candomblé in Brazil, we have uh, the cult of Chango in Trinidad and Tobago, Orisha Voodoo in the United States of America. How does it differ throughout the world? Like, is, does the religion change at all, or is it pretty, like, straightforward? Yes, Santeria is a dynamic religion. In this, Santeria was created as a result of the transformation of the Yoruba tradition. Even nowadays, Santeria is changing a lot. Why? Because Santeria it is a, a, a non-centralized religion. Uh, what sort of role does your religion play in the rest of Cuban life and in Cuban politics? Well, the, the role of Santeria in our population is widespread. A lot of people practice this tradition. A lot of people use their, these traditions to solve problems. If they were very important members of the revolutionary movement, that they were practitioners of this tradition. Even though there are some gossip, gossipers that said that Fidel was a practitioner of this religion. We don't know if it's true or not, but he used elements of this tradition. Now, um, as a culmination of everything I've learned over this trip, I actually wrote a song inspired by Cuban music, 